guests. Welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the folks focused on the future and building it better. Today, we've got somebody who's thinking about a whole lot of things and running a lot of experiments at once, AJ Jacobs on the program. AJ, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me, Matt. Human guinea pig, what happened? How'd you get there? What in God's name went wrong? <laughs> well, I, I like to write, and I'd always been told to um, write what you know, but I didn't really know anything. And I also had uh, not a very interesting life. So I thought, what if I try to do some interesting experiments on myself and write about that? So that's how I came to this genre, the sort of self-experimenter, the... Um, uh, like my uh, my friend Tim Ferriss, sort of in that genre. How'd you meet him? H had your stuff gone big before you went on the podcast? Oh yeah, that's actually a funny story. I think it's funny anyway. He, um, I had written a book already and he reached out to me uh, by email or phone and said, I'm a first time writing my first book. I don't know what I'm doing. Can you tell me how to write a book? And I was like, this guy's got chutzpah. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I'll tell you how I write a book, and if it's helpful, fine. So I gave him some tips. And, um, and then at that point, his book was called Drug Dealing for Fun and Profit. It was uh, because he had this nutraceutical company that he was talking about. Uh, a year later, I get an email from him saying, hey, just wanted to let you know my book is coming out. Uh, I changed the name. It's called The 4-Hour Workweek, and it is number one on Amazon. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know whether it let me do that again. No, it's all good. Well, so, because I was like, you know, how did that happen? And, uh, and I found out later he had all these brilliant marketing ideas of meeting people. The blogosphere was just starting. But uh, I thought that was really quite remarkable. But we've been friends ever since. And, oh, the other thing, just to finish up, is I had written an article for Esquire magazine called My Outsourced Life, where I hired a team of people in Bangalore, India, to do everything for me. They answered my phone. They answered my email. They argued with my wife for me. And, uh, and it sort of went viral. And Tim asked if he could reproduce that article if he could print the article in his book like out he basically outsourced his chapter on outsourcing to me so the, the chapter on outsourcing in the four hour work week is with my name it's uh it's basically that so uh they you know i uh, at first i was like you know what the hell uh, maybe i should have asked for more money but in the long run it, and I didn't ask for any money, but in the long run, it turned out to be a good decision because he's so popular that people know me from his work. Yeah, you've done, well, you've also done some really interesting stuff. We're going to, we're going to dive into that. Talk to me. We talked a little bit about the program. You decided to build a world family tree, so to speak. I tell, did. Yeah. Tell me about that and tell me why, and then we can get to the pros and cons. Yeah, I would love to. Uh, it started because it was about four years ago, and I got an email from this guy who said, you don't know me, but I'm your 12th cousin. And I thought, of course, he's going to ask me to wire $10,000 to Nigeria. I thought it was a scam. But it turns out he's part of this group of scientists and researchers who are building this mega family tree, like a forest of not just hundreds or thousands of people, but millions of people in every country in the world. And they're doing it through two technologies, DNA testing, and through so the sort of a wiki approach to family tree where you have thousands of people contributing to the same tree. And I just thought this was so cool. Well, I love this idea that we've always been told we're the humans are one big family, but this was the first time that science has allowed us to see this concretely. And I thought, well, maybe, like you were saying uh, when we were chatting before the show, maybe this is one way we can solve this crazy tribalism crisis and maybe start to treat each other a little more kindly uh, or a little less terribly. <laughs> um, so I dove in and I decided to write a book on the movement. And then what happened? <laughs> well, then uh, I did a write. I actually... Um, as part of the book, I thought, 
you know, I've got all these newly discovered millions of cousins, some by blood, some by marriage. Uh, and you could figure out with these tools how anyone on earth is related to you. So like Barack Obama, this is true. He's my fifth great aunt's husband's brother's wife's seventh great nephew. So we're very close. Um, and I, I thought with all these millions of cousins, maybe I can, should throw the biggest family reunion ever. So that's what I did. I, I threw an event for the end of the book, which had about uh, 4,000 people in New York, but 10,000 worldwide at 42 different simultaneous uh, festivals that were linked by the internet. And it was, um, it was a very strange day. I found it incredibly horrible because I was so stressed, but other people said they had a good time. And we had all sorts of interesting speakers. And, and um, Sister Sledge came and saying, we are family. So that was a highlight. That's pretty cool. I feel like if you could create that experience for people, it's, it's kind of akin to getting around and smoking weed together or having LSD and trying to have that experience of oneness. But yeah, <laughs> that was the hope. There are, there are some drawbacks as well. Genetic testing, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are just what you said. I think there are some big pros and big cons. Um, and I won't even get into the health, which is a whole other uh, area, but just in terms of ancestry, doing your 23 in the ancestry, uh, I'll qu quickly give you like two positives and two negatives. So one, po my hope was when everyone sees that they're basically, we're all a mix, we're all mutts, no one is purely one thing or another, that it would help break down this racism and tribalism. Uh, and, and there is evidence that this does happen. There was a great study by Harvard two years ago where they took Palestinians and Israelis and they gave the, them d DNA tests and they told one group of, of them that the, how closely they were related. So you could see genetically how Palestinians and Israelis were related. And the other, they did not. And the group that was told they were genetically related actually did treat each other with more kindness and they were more open to negotiation. So according to at least this study, it does have an effect. Um, and uh, so, so that was the big hope. Uh, now on the other side, I am increasingly worried that it'll do the opposite, that it'll have a negative effect and it'll just reinforce tribalism and uh, identity politics. Uh, because we've seen a little of this already. You've got white supremacists on, the, on their websites comparing who has the most European DNA. Um, you have the danger, I talked to one Princeton sociologist whose greatest fear is Tinder meets 23andMe. So you- They have that in Finland already. Just I know. Just updating the cousin, I right? I love that, don't they? Um, but this would be almost the opposite where you would say, I'm only gonna date people who are 50% Swedish or above. And it would uh, sort of push back against this. The, the trend over the last few decades is intermarriage. We are becoming much more mixed than we were. But uh, there is a fear if we become too obsessed with our percentages that we'll just retreat into our silos. And that to me would be a disaster. I think it would be as well. I think it would be different if you presented it rather than glass half full or glass half empty, glass half full. So instead of saying you're 90% Aryan uh, European saying you're 10% African American. That's so a great way to Suddenly you flip, you flip around the thing. It's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't hate yada yada for yada yada. But yeah, yeah. I, could, I could see how that could be a problem. It's kind of like the, the Harry Potter analogy. I'm not marrying a muggle. <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm all for the, uh, the half-blood princes. I want the world to be half-blood and I want everyone to mix together. I think that is one solution. And actually, I, I took all sorts of different DNA tests and, uh, and, and they all came out slightly differently. So that was proof it's not, not quite um, you know, hundred percent accurate yet. But one of them I thought was interesting. I was ninety-seven percent Ashkenazi Jew and uh, uh, three percent Arab. So I liked the fact that I had this 
the sort of the um, Middle East conflict going on in my body. Yeah, it makes you uh, makes you a little more credible. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> there's there's potentially other problems as well as just having that information. Not that necessarily who you're related to, but having just the security of of genetic information out there. So who knows what about you? And then there's the flip side. They found out, oh, look, Europeans are more Neanderthal than other part of, let's just say African-Americans for, we'll, we'll use political terms. But what if, that, what if that had gone the other direction? People Absolutely. get, people find the propaganda they want to find. What happens if the statistics, what happens if the truth doesn't boil out to what we want it to look like? Absolutely. I mean, those are two big issues. Just on the first, the privacy, I think that that uh, gives me a lot of pause. Uh, I mean, in 50 years, if we have our Google contact lenses, and um, it's going to be hard to keep our genome private, I can imagine. And, you know, you go into a bar, your facial recognition software identifies the person and you see their genome oh they don't have the uh they don't have enough monogamy genes or whatever i'm not gonna uh maybe i'll have a one night stand but i'm not gonna have a long relationship with them uh yeah i mean to me that that is scary as well it's the you know gattaca was a wonder did you ever see that movie it's a great movie great movie uh so i i do fear for that and then uh wait what was the other one you mentioned the other uh, concern. So one of it was on the security side, and then one of it was on the inconvenient truth side. Because oh, right. if we're being realistic, there is zero percent chance that all populations throughout humanity's history have exactly the same levels of athleticism and intelligence and creativity. You only need to look at the NBA or the NFL to say, okay, maybe that's not entirely true. Certain people are better at certain things. Yeah, and exactly that is uh, that is a problem and. And I guess I don't have a solution except just don't focus on it. There are so many other things to focus on than whether you have your gene pool has a higher genetic disposition to a certain trait. So, uh, you know, try to solve problems instead of create them. How do you think about which problems are for you, which experiments to run or to solve? Uh, well, those are two different because I'm actually very interested in cause prioritization like in the big picture. Um, uh, but in terms of my own life, I, um, I think about partly it's just what I'm passionate about. So I love these, the topics I've chosen are religion, health, um, gratitude. You chose all the controversial stuff. <laughs> I did. I was very nervous about doing a book on religion. Uh, but I, I say, you know what, I'm going to, uh, I'm just too interested and I'll see what happens. And it wasn't as bad. I did not get, I got much less flack than I thought and much more positive feedback. So, so that emboldened me. Um, but I think also what will resonate with people, what has universal applicability, is that a word? Ap applications. So, you know, can other people do a similar experiment on their own lives? All those things. So speaking of the religion side of things, your opinion, religion, net positive, net negative on the world today. We won't say, we won't say in the past. That can oh, be argued goodness. here and there. That is a hard one. I think I need about uh, a year and a half to do some calculations. I, I mean, obviously, it is, it's got huge positives and huge negatives. Um, so let me just go over those as I see them, and then maybe I can figure out whether it's positive or negative. The positives, I grew up with no religion at all. I'm, you know, I was atheist, I still am. I, uh, I say in the book, I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. So not very. Uh, but this project was, should, is there anything in religion that could make my life better? And there are a few things. I mean, one, the sense of community. I think that's very, religion is a lot about, um, seeing the world as a set of responsibilities instead of a, a set of rights, uh, responsibilities to your elders, to your, your, um, your family. And I like that. I think we've gone a little too far into rights, like I am owed this by society. Uh, so that's one positive. 
getting together with people and just talking about ethics and once a week, I mean, that has, it seems there are clear health benefits to it. I, the studies show that people who go to church live longer. And I don't believe it's because God smites the unbelievers. Maybe it's true. So the first, I, that's what the New Old Testament says. Right. <laughs> well, if that's true, I'm in trouble. But uh, I think that most scientists think it's because you form this strong social network. So that there are many things about religion that are good. Uh, the most troubling thing to me is just the, um, that it, uh, unlike science, it, it's much harder to update your beliefs. So if you are presented with evidence, you, um, you reject it sometimes, especially, you know, if you're a fundamentalist, you just say, oh, that, uh, that's, uh, false and, um, you know, updating, is, che updating is cheating, right? You can't, up What's that? if you have to update something that's perfect, it's not perfect. I think that's the problem. That is a problem. Exactly. There is no updating. I mean, it all happened 2000 years ago and that's it. Yeah. It's one of those things where I feel like it was beneficial for humanity up to a certain point, but like a lot of things, we evolved past them. We evolved past needing a pacifier. We evolved past needing diapers. Certain things are beneficial until they're not. Agree. And, um, and one question, though, I, I still don't know the answer to is it some sort of secular religion? Is that, is that uh, it, would the benefits of that outweigh the costs? And I don't know the answer. I mean, for my book on the year of living biblically, I went to, a, I hung out with an atheist group for a while, which was hilarious. Like they, we had a meeting, they have meetings. Uh, and it was like 50 people at a restaurant. And, uh, and I think a, a symbolic, uh, a symbol of how hard it is to have an atheist group is everyone had their own separate check. Everyone demanded a separate check from the restaurant. So the restaurant hated us. But uh, it's sort of um, the leader of the atheist group, is it, it said it's, it's very hard to unify a group of atheists uh, because it's much easier if you have this really shared myth. Uh, is it the shared myth or is it the fact that the people that follow the shared myth are more likely to be followers than leaders? Good question. I, I would guess I don't know. Both. I don't have the answer. I imagine I it's I don't both. have the answer either, but probably both. Yeah. I mean, the people who are prone to be atheist are probably more independent minded. Yeah, you go. That's one of the things about it. When, the default is always what people use the most of. People use the Apple Podcast app, not because it's the best, but because it's on their phone. Right. And the problem with labeling something as atheism is that's not the default. The default. The, so to switch to the default takes so much extra effort. It's like someone leaving a review. How many people buy something on Amazon and how many actually leave a review? Right. And I think that I actually like, I think his name is Sean Carroll. He's a physicist, but he's trying to rebrand it as uh, naturalism because atheism is yeah. you know, Real, a, reality. Right. Real, why should, why should uh, atheism be the negative? Say naturalism. We believe in what we, the natural world, what we see, what we can experience. And um, I like that. I like the idea of be, being a naturalist. I like the idea of being a naturalist as well. You seem like a generally happy, energetic person. I hear you have the secret to happiness. <laughs> no. Well, I that you know what the secret is? is it's all is it a, coffee? You know, an act. No. Well, a little bit. Coffee definitely helps. But um, I, I talk about this in my most recent book on gratitude. I think my, my factory setting, my default, is negativity and pessimism. You know, I, if you're looking at the spectrum from Larry David to, to Mr. Rogers. I think I'm definitely more born on the Larry David side. But I also, I like Larry David. I like watching his show. It's funny. But I don't like living inside that mindset. It's very unpleasant. So I have made a real, um, I've made it a, a conscious effort, a, a crusade to try to uh, to be less negative and to embrace the positive. And a lot of times 
it's this fake it till you feel it. I pretend to be positive and usually my mind catches up. But that is, you know, that's one of the big lessons of all my experiments. Uh, it's, it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. I didn't make that quote up. So uh, it was the founder of Habitat for Humanity, but I love it. I think it's very true. I love it and I think it's true as well. But what about the, the flip side, the devil's advocate? Ignorance is bliss. So the easiest way to be happy is just to not know about things and accept them for where they are. This also relates to the previous topic we were talking about. But how do you think about that? Where people that are more into questioning things generally, A, have a more negative or critical look. Scientists always want to prove each other wrong. That's how they get credit. And that because they are like that, it would inherently make them less happy. I think it, I do think about that a lot. I'm not sure I buy that ignorance is bliss. Uh, like I think about, um, for instance, you know, if you are terrified that you're going to hell because you masturbate, that's not happiness. So uh, I do think that they don't perfectly align truth and happiness. But I think that a general heuristic to try to pursue the truth will make you happier. At least I hope so. I could be deluding myself. I could be uh, uh, willfully ignorant on that point. Do you think that intelligence is inversely proportional to happiness? I know we have a, we have a baby now or a toddler, I guess. And my wife was saying before he came into the picture, I hope he's not too smart because when you're too smart, it just seems like we notice more negative than we notice positive. The, the higher the intelligence threshold goes. I mean, Elon Musk must hate life. <laughs> he, he's an incredible, he's an incredible person. He craziness and other things aside, he's an incredible person doing incredible things, but his life looks like it sucks from the outside. He does and, seem very, and I don't know how, doesn't he have kids? How is he's, he old? he's got kids. He's been divorced a couple times, although the ones that have divorced him, they all love him. But he's sleeping on the factory floor. He's putting it all on the line. He doesn't right? seem like a happy person. Well, let me, let me push back on that for one second. Uh, I don't know this, like, it's for, sort of an empirical question, or how does IQ uh, cor correlate with happiness? But I am going to say it. It's not an automatic that, that smart people are less happy. And what makes me think that is, is sort of the Steven Pinker point of view, like really fighting against the, the negative bias by looking at the big picture. Because the negative bias is, it's really easy. It's really easy to notice if you get 100 compliments and one insult, I mean, at least for me, I remember the insult. That's sort of the, the default. So maybe with intelligence, you can fight the negative bias and look at the big picture. Look at when you read about a horrible fire that kills eight people. Sure, you feel compassion, but you step back and say, you know what? The number of house fires over the last 40 years has dropped by like 90%. Thousands of lives have been saved. And maybe that will help you and give you a little more optimism and happiness. And that's the next direction, I think, for this. Is the media to blame? Is the advertising model to blame? Because they're incentivized to make us feel like shit. Because that's what gets us to keep looking. The, the things we're evolutionarily evolved for are to watch to see if, A, your wife or whoever is cheating, or B, if someone in your tribe just got killed, or C, if there's some type of outsider. We're looking for negative. We're looking for violence. If it bleeds, it leads. And you see that everywhere in the media. News, if it was taken on a 100-year time horizon, everything would be incredible. It'd be almost all good things with, oops, World War II, oops, World War I. But <laughs> because we have, a, we have that frequency of the news, it's incentivized to make us feel terrible to spend time in eyeballs. Agree. I mean, I agree. I agree 98%. I'll give you the 2% later. But the 98%, is, uh, it's a terrible, the negative bias in the news. And I, I'm a journalist. Uh, that's one of the things that drives me most crazy is, I, I think Trump is a horrible and a dangerous man. Um, and he attacks the press and says that they're terrible. I agree they're terrible, but for very different reasons than him. Uh, but I agree with you. It's what, the, what they focus on, it's dispiriting. So you read the world is going to hell 
in a handbasket instead of reading about life expectancy going up or, or amazing medical advances. Those are not interesting. Uh, so that leads to despair and to nihilism. So I think that's a big problem. Now the 2% where I disagree is I think that overall things are getting better and better and better, but I think that when things go wrong, we have the capacity for them to go very wrong. Like, you know, the, the sort of the existential threats that people talk about, like, you know, pandemics or, or AI. Uh, so yes, I am optimistic about the general arc of history being good, but I'm also terrified that we could take this huge uh, plunge. I would agree. I think the negativity most people have isn't around existential risk. I feel like <laughs> I feel like that's kind of where the ignorance is bliss. Humanities, we have filters to avoid those things. We don't really we don't really even think about brushing our teeth. We don't even really think about looking both ways across the streets. We've simplified lives. Mm. But I mean a meteor could come and kind of take us out. Right. Tomorrow. tomorrow. I mean the the problem, I think, is like you say, we're programmed to find certain things very um, resonant. So like, you know, the fear of getting mugged or the fear of a stranger abducting us, that, like, I can get stressed just saying that. Whereas the fear of, uh, you know, the earth rising two degrees in the next 50 years, that's so abstract. I like, I don't know how to get my hands on it. So I don't, I, can't, I, I don't have the same gut reaction, even though it's going to have far more of a, an effect on my life. Is there a way to put things in perspective? I know I've lived around the world a little bit, and we've moved back to the U.S. from Europe. And you see everyone here is nervous. They're worried, oh, my God, my kid can't walk down the street on his own. Or, oh, my gosh, this piece of food fell on the ground, and Johnny's just going to get sick and die. It's like... There's so much more paranoia when it comes to health, safety, and security here. Part of it's part of it's the legal system of people getting sued. Part of it's there seems to be more murders, violence, et cetera. But part of it's just neurotic. <laughs> and it, it doesn't seem to exist other places. And, and the neuroticism, at least towards health, the U.S. has like the worst health outcomes of the Western world. So it's not like it's helping, it's hurting. That is true. That's an irony. Like the more you stress out, the less is, less good it is for your health. Uh, I, I mean, in general, that was one of the things I tried to tackle in my, my last book was uh, adjusting my, uh, my point of view. So really making an effort to notice the hundreds of things that go right every day instead of the three or four that go wrong. So uh, and I did this actually during the re the religious experiment because the Bible says to give thanks for everything. So I took that literally and I would press an elevator button and I'd give thanks that the elevator came and I'd get in the elevator and be thankful it didn't plummet to the basement. And did you go crazy? Could you accomplish anything? No, <laughs> that's the thing. It had its drawbacks. It was a bizarre way to live and a little time consuming. But uh, it also had its wonderful uh, benefits because you realized it made it very clear all the hundreds of things that have to go right for every little part of our life and that we totally take those for granted and we focus on the negative, which, is, which just causes, like you say, unhappiness, paranoia, anxiousness. So, um, I, I, you know, I don't do that as literally anymore, but, but when I'm online at, a, at the drugstore and the line goes fast, I really try to even say it out loud, you know, like a maniac and say, look at that, this line went so fast. So the next time I'm online, which goes super slow, I won't be, I won't be complaining to myself, this always happens to me, I have the worst luck. I'll, be, I'll have the memory like, oh, you know what, things even out. Yeah, a little extra time for meditation and gratitude, right? It's, there you go. It's hard, it's hard to do, though. It's something I try to do and struggle with. Mm. So, oh, yeah, no, it's a discipline. It's, it's super hard. It, it, it goes against uh, our, our uh, genetic, uh, you know, our, our wired brain, I think. So you wanted to be drop dead healthy and Tim wanted the four hour abs body. <laughs> what, was it, what was it like playing in the same space? What did you learn from the experiment? I, uh, well, yeah, he was one of my advisors. I had like a team of, of bodily advisors. So I had, uh, uh, you know, trainers and doctors and scientists and geneticists. Uh, and my, the, the big picture was I, 
I was I was in uh, you know terrible shape. I wasn't traditionally obese. I was skinny fat, so it was sort of the snake that swallows the goat type body. And uh, and I got sick a lot, and so I thought, let me try to do what I did with the Bible, where I take every bit of advice that I can find and test it out on my body and see what works. And I wanted to to try to uh, to, to work on every part of my life. So there was diet and exercise, they're the most obvious, but there's also sleep is huge, stress, um, sex life, going to the bathroom. I tried to go to the bathroom as healthily as possible. So what all, does that look like? Well, I won't get into too many details, but I, I mean, it's become much more uh, mainstream now. But Squatty I, potty? Yeah, exactly. I went a little farther than Squatty Potty. You can get this device, which basically turns your your first world toilet into a developing world toilet. So you put it over the toilet and you can stand on it and it's a hole so that you can like really squat. And uh, I had that for like a week until my wife is like, this this will not stand, so to speak. So uh, anyway, I, I, I thought it was fascinating and I learned a ton. It did change my life. It also made me very skeptical um, of self-proclaimed health gurus because uh, there are so many people who are saying things with such confidence and absolutely no evidence to back it up. Well, yeah, that's the perfect part about ignorance is we can say whatever and believe it. We have a, <laughs> we have a president who's specialized in it. Um, he is very good. What, what were some of the takeaways that you actually learned or the things that were most beneficial? Most beneficial, one was, we already discussed it, that um, don't, it's unhealthy to be overly obsessed with your health because it does cause stress. So I do believe that. I believe that, you know, if you go out to dinner with friends, that can be as good as going to the gym. You know, having a close-knit social uh uh, social group is very important. Uh, I still do. I still um, think that we we uh, eat too much and move too little. So I do still work on a treadmill desk. Um, so I, I it took me about I think five thousand miles to write the book, uh, but I I usually walk a few miles a day on my treadmill. I love that. Um, and what's it's one not of those, just, what's one of those cost. Well, it cost, I actually made my own, it was like a, you know, a homemade version. So it's just a regular treadmill with this, uh, I balanced all sorts of things on it. So, um, but you can buy expensive ones that are pre-made for, I think about 1500, but I just made my own. Uh, what else did I learn? I, I would say, um, that uh, I think you've actually talked about this on your show, that I am really not, uh, I, put, I put very little faith in willpower. And uh, so I think setting up your environment so that you're the lab rat is, that really is the best way to encourage healthy habits. So getting rid of the, you know, the crappy food. I actually can't because I have kids and they love their sugar. And I, you know, uh, oh, you, so haven't, I, you haven't won that fight yet. Oh, I lost. Yeah. No, I don't anticipate winning, uh, but, uh, but putting it, what hiding it, you know, putting it on the top shelf. So it's a pain in the ass to get that really, um, that really helps heuristics, uh, just simple things like, you know, I try to always eat out of the fridge instead of going into the cabinet because the fridge has fruit that rots uh, and, and I think good food generally goes bad. Real Where, food. Yeah, real food. Whereas, uh, yeah, bad food uh, will stay around till Armageddon. That is absolutely true. I think having some of those set rules as well, like I don't drink alcohol or I don't oh. do X, Y, Z from then to then. Once it's a rule, you can set it and forget it and life becomes simple again. Totally. And I actually talked about this, um, you know, sort of the... Uh, uh, the blackmailing yourself strategy I've used uh, and I've found that successful. So uh, it, I was, it was based on some research by a Yale professor who actually started a website called stick.com with two K's stick.com. And the idea is you say, 
Now, if I, for me, it was mango, dried mangoes, which are, you know, they're fruit, but they're really sugar. Yeah. When, they, when they're dried, they're just candy. Exactly. So I was like, I ate so many of them. And I said to my wife, don't let me, if I eat another dried mango, I want you to write a check to charity. But the key is you, you choose an anti-charity. So I say, you know, make a hundred dollar check to the American Nazi party if I, if I trip. And that was so uh, incentivizing. There was no way I was going to let any of my money go to the American Nazi party. And it really worked. Like I did not, I haven't eaten dried mangoes. I guess it's been like seven years now. It's impressive. I know I had a I had a problem with peanut butter and bananas. It's quite good. If you go there, you will have trouble going back. What Elvis's a, favorite food. Elvis's favorite food. The king is still here, apparently. Yeah. What's, what the, what project are you working on or thinking about these days? Well, I am working on a a project. I was going to do. A, I signed up to do a book that I still think is an interesting idea but I abandoned it because I was worried that it would have negative consequences. So just quickly, that one was, was called Fact Checking My Life. And it was, um, I was really concerned about this post-truth uh, idea and, uh, and our inability to you know, fact check properly. So I was gonna fact check everything. I, is, is the world really round? How do I know that? Uh, does my wife love me? She says she loves me, how do I know that? So it was fact checking everything. And I still like the idea. My concern was when I started to write it and talk to people about it, I was worried that it would just uh, contribute to the problem instead of help solve it. Because people were like, oh yeah, I agree. We can never know anything. There is no truth. It's all just perception. And I was like, no, that's not the point of my project. I was, you know, my point was uh, truth is hard. You have to roll up your sleeve and it's not clear. It's, it's often probabilistic, but there, but there is a way to get to the truth and uh, you know science, and we've got to try to uh, we've got to work at it. But I was worried it would just cause more problems. So then I totally pivoted to a new project, which is about puzzles. I'm going to try to solve all the hardest puzzles in the world. So wh whether those are um, uh, crosswords or uh, jigsaw puzzles or meaning of life. And that, well, that's the last chapter. Yeah, what is the, can I solve the puzzle of like stopping people from, from uh, ending humanity? That'll be, that'll be the, the final puzzle. I was talking to another guest, James Maskell. He runs a, a health sharing program. So it's like health insurance, but instead of getting screwed, and instead of having a business behind it, you're pooling resources together with individuals and then going more for a collective health approach. It hmm. seemed to work a lot better, but he grew up on a commune, which was, seemed very interesting the way he talked about it. And I thought, because I was having you after this, that could make a really interesting book for you to try to build the perfect commune because <laughs> the way we're living right now is not super healthy. Mm. But the commune, interesting. Is, yeah, a commune is looked at kind of like hippie LSD. Yeah, that was the 70s. But is that the future where, I mean, you're the average of the people you surround yourself with. Why not yeah. surround yourself with incredible people? That's interesting. Now, in this commune, was it uh, group parenting or did they have separate families? See, that's the thing. They, uh, I didn't get super into all of the details, but I thought, because uh, I brought up at the end, well, you liked it a lot. Would you ever consider doing it again? And I was like, hmm, I wonder if you could make this into an experiment or into a book. It would be fascinating. I talked a bit in my book on families and, and uh, the world family about whether group families is a good idea. It seems at this point to me that most of those experiments fail, that, that human nature right now is it's too ingrained to have the, you know, the nuclear family. Uh, but maybe that'll change. And it's interesting to follow. I have a chapter in that same book on polyamory and this idea of that that's a better way to structure relationships. Personally, I, am, uh, I prefer monogamy, not for moral reasons. I have no moral problems with polyamory, more for logistical reasons. It would stress me out too much to have that too many things on my Google calendar. So, and remember- No one's got time for Aram. 
<laughs> well, some people do. Apparent, I think apparently. Uh, but yeah, no. Well, the harem idea, it's interesting because that sort of implies it's one man and many women, which I do think is a problem. Uh, as long as it's more uh, egalitarian and it's many men and many women, then I think I have no moral problem. Yeah, historically, we haven't been real big on women's rights. We've kind of pushed those away with every religious book and political doctrine we've been able to, unfortunately. Yeah, it has been interesting. So I know you're interested in the future and where we're headed. What technology or trend are you most excited about and why? Well, um, I am excited. I'm both excited and terrified of many, many, many things. Um, so... Well, one that I'm excited about is the, uh, the idea of clean meat and, um, you know, lab-grown meat. But I like the phrase clean meat because it's, uh, who can argue with clean meat? Uh, and, uh, you know, if that takes off, either that or plant-based, I'm happy with the Impossible Burger, too. But I do, uh, I, I'm a weird case because I, I, I don't really like animals as a, you know, I think that most of them are probably assholes. Like they're not, they don't have developed sense of, they don't have like huge frontal cortexes and, and huge amounts of compassion. They have some, but they're generally, I think. Wouldn't that make them innocent? Well, I don't think it's a matter of innocence or guilt. Um, uh, the point I was trying to make is, you know, I, I don't, I don't love animals, but I do believe they suffer. And if, if my ethical lens is to reduce suffering and increase happiness, then I have to take them into account, animals into account. Um, but I'm not like an animal rights person who like just loves cuddling with dolphins or whatever. Uh, so I am very excited about the possibility of clean meat. That doesn't seem to have a huge downside. I, I don't, uh, you know, maybe. What about all the animals that will no longer have a need in the world to be, exist? I'm just playing flip side. I'm very. No, no. Well, it's. In, I mean, do the cows who li who live in factory farms have a net positive life? I would argue no. I think they would be happy to have never been born. Um, you know, if there's cows who like have a wonderful life and live on the pasture and then are killed all at once with their whole family killed at the same time. I'm actually not that opposed to that, weirdly. Uh, it's more just the suffering part that I find uh, morally repugnant. That could be a book as well. You have the AJ burger. Someone creates a little bit of a, take some of your protein DNA and grow something for you. You talk totally. about clean meat. I know. I mean, that's what's great about clean meat is it breaks down all the taboos. There's, you know, any animal, endangered or not, you could have. And as you say, humans, why not? And I think that if there are any, I know there are a lot of entrepreneurs who listen to your show, but that to me is like celebrity meat. Yeah. There's a market. I know. I've talked to a few vegetarians and vegans that say they wouldn't do it. And I just, I kind of, I kind of have to laugh. Like, why? They wouldn't I, I eat celebrities? No, no, not, no not celebrities. Eat. Celebrities is a little, that's a little bit weird. They would, they, <laughs> I'm not saying I would eat celebrities. Mm -hmm. Perhaps some of them. No, but <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of clean meat, it's like, I was a vegetarian for a long time, actually, for a very long time. And it was a moral thing. It certainly wasn't a health thing because I don't, all the science shows vegetarianism is not healthier. But if you could have something without any suffering, it's like, yeah, if you want to give me a free dollar bill, sure, I'll take your free dollar bill. I agree. I I have no problem with it. But uh, yeah, it just, it seems like it's more of like, um, you can't, it was interesting in one of my books, I talked about um, that I tried to be the most rational person alive and get rid of all cognitive biases. And, and one of them that I think is kind of related to this fear of eating fake meat was uh, this one experimenter made chocolate that looked, it was in the shape of fecal mat. It looked like poop. And people would not eat it, even though he was very clear. He's like, this is, this is chocolate. There's no poop here. This is pure chocolate. But just the fact that it looked like it 
was enough that they couldn't get over it. So some of our biases, I think, are so ingrained, it's going to be hard to get over them. Because rationally, I'm sure they understand, yeah, I, I, it's not hurting anything. But, but there's something visceral that's hard. What's it like as an author these days? The business has changed a lot, publishing, self-publishing, podcasting, you're coming on here. Hopefully some people will check out your books. What's it like as an author these days and what's changed? Well, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a harder business than it was. I, I feel very lucky that, um, you know, I'm, I can You've made that. it at this point. I do. I feel I got in on, I got grandfathered. I mean, starting out today, I would not want to try it because Today, when I started, I just started as a journalist and then I started writing books. But, it, but today, if you try that, there's a very low percentage of that working out unless you have um, a, another platform. Because publishers always ask, you know, how many Twitter followers do you have? Like, uh, you know, do you have a podcast? How many followers? So it's very hard to just start as a a no-name journalist and become an author. So, uh, and, and a lot of my author friends are um, are making part or most of their money from doing speaking gigs, which I I do that sometimes, uh, and I like that actually. It's a different skill set, but I like it. Uh, so, in one sense, it's a very exciting time to be an author, just because there are so many ways to be creative and so many. You can use all sorts of media and outlets, but in other ways, it's it's just getting a lot harder to monetize. Yeah, it's uh, it's changing. Patreon is doing something, so we have some supporters on Patreon. By the way, guys, if you like this and want to unlock the bonus episode, bonus uh, lightning round, which is about to come up, disruptors.fm/patreon. But it's yeah, it's hard. There's and with traditional media, I mean, you're kind of going for the eyeballs route, you're going for the selling route, or you're, you're, you're shit out of luck. Yeah. I mean, it's been interesting to see that some of the traditional media is flourishing, like the New York Times. People are paying exorbitant amounts, including me, to access it because it's one of the few that is relatively reliable. Well, they make mistakes, but they're relatively reliable. Uh, but... Uh, but that's got just a small percentage of the media and the rest is just so in flux. And I don't even, you know, one of the things that I've, uh, I've come to over the years is just how hard it is to predict the future. So I, I am not, uh, when people ask me, you know, where do you see the media going? I'm like, I'm sorry. I got no idea. So I, you know, there, here's five scenarios. It could be any one of them. Well, that's always helpful as well. Yeah, I guess so. I want to jump into that lightning round now. So if you guys haven't become patrons, disruptors.fm slash Patreon, we got three to four bonus awesome questions with every guest. You ready, AJ? I am ready. I have a couple more questions for you. First, you're an interesting, well-rounded guy. What do you look to on a daily, weekly basis to stay informed? Sites, podcasts, et cetera. That's an interesting question. I, I do think a lot about this. I think I think a lot about more about restricting my information diet than expanding it because I think it's dangerous to get caught in the weeds too much. Um, so even, uh, you know, I think it's good that there are some people in the weeds. I just don't think that's my strength. So I'm glad there are some people who are like on top of these Democratic candidates. And um, But I am... I, I'd rather, I think my talent is better used, uh, if I have any, on looking at, you know, longer term. Uh, so, so I do try to, I read, I still read books, I, you know, good plug in for books. Um, I, I do try to read, uh, I like websites like, um, you know, uh, Slate Star Codex and uh, Less Wrong and uh, these other sort of these rationalist websites, I think, are very interesting. Um, and I do look at the week has 10 things you need to know today. And it's just a paragraph on each. So that uh, I try to limit my current events to that and try to focus on bigger trends in, uh, in the rest of my information diet. If I gave you a magic wand and 
uh, seemingly unlimited funding to solve a problem, what problem would you solve and why? Oh, that's interesting. I think, you know, what I would, th I would solve is the, the truth problem. I would, because uh, I do think it's, it, it's the mother of all problems, because if we can't agree on what the truth is, it's very hard to uh, uh, solve the other problems. So if we, we have the, you know, people who are climate change deniers, then how are we going to get enough people to change uh, the uh, our behavior and save the climate. So it is, uh, it would be to a magic wand so that everyone would sort of be well versed, more well versed than me. I would like to be part of this group because I, I, I have some knowledge of uh, how to uh, think uh, about truth, but I'd like more. But I think I'd love everyone to be much more aware of rules of evidence and um, Bayesian thinking and all these sorts of uh, positive ways that we can approach the truth. Yeah, that should definitely be included more in schools. And it's problematic because even professors that study this kind of stuff still fall for the same things because we're human. Right. Well, that's the depressing thing about listening to like Danny Kahneman talk uh, about how he doesn't think even when you're aware of the biases that you can do anything about it. He's obviously <laughs> smarter than me, but I am more optimistic than him. I do think, and I think it's, I've seen it in my own decision making. When I am really aware of how, it, it, you know, that I'm focusing on the negative, I am able to somewhat change and focus on the positive. Mindfulness. Are you a meditator? I should be. I know very well I should be. There's uh, another book, right? Yeah, exactly. I imagine people tell you that all the time. This should be a book. <laughs> it's true. That's a, it's helpful. I haven't gotten some ideas from people, so I don't mind. One last question before you tell people where to find you about the books and all the good stuff. And that's if you had to leave people with one thing, it could be anything, a quote, a call to action, what would it be and why? Hmm. Well, maybe I'll do a little call back to that quote which I didn't make up, but it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. Uh, I, that really has changed my life for the better. So, you know, pretend that asking yourself, what would, a, what would a happy person do? What would a compassionate person do? What would an optimistic person do? And then act that way. And uh, yeah, it's not foolproof, but uh, it, it, it moves the needle. Fake it till you make it. Let's do it. Where can okay. people find you, AJ? I am at uh, ajjacobs.com or at Twitter at AJ Jacobs. And uh, yeah, and my book's called Thanks a Thousand. And uh, reach out. Yeah. Be a little happier. Be a little bit more inquisitive. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Matt. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Hope this has been fun. We've bounced around a lot of topics with the master bouncer himself. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>